Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. Let me start by saying, yes, the family curse is real. Let me also say, since I moved back, the least crazy thing I've seen was when Travis stabbed Andy with a pocket knife. Right in the bar where I'm writing this. I'll tell you about Travis and Andy in a minute, but first let me explain why I'm here at all. Plus, I can get you caught up on the gossip about the sacrifices. You heard right. Sacrifices. My grandpa Curtis opened the bar 35 years ago and died six years later. I suspect his passing may have happened a little sooner because of his time spent here. When he passed, he left it to his brother Charles, my great uncle. Then a few months ago, I inherited it. That's when I learned about the family curse. You heard that right too. I'll get to it all, I promise. Curtis's House of Ill Repute is a small bar in a small town nestled along the coast of South Carolina. The biggest thing you're likely to see around here is one of the mosquitoes. Rural Route 261 cuts straight through the middle of a town called Stuckey, which is a few miles away. The bar is easy to find. Head towards the town of Hemingway and follow the signs for Annie's Orchard. They're the ones that say pick a bushel, pick a bunch, which isn't a bad deal for 20 bucks, and yes, they spelled bushel with a C. We serve the best fried chicken livers east of the Missoula River. It was my grandma's recipe and worth the trip. If you decide to drop in, you'll see us off to the right in front of the old dirt field. But do me a favor if you could. Park around back. I don't mind it, but some folks around here don't much like come here's. In case you don't know, that's a localism talking about the out-of-town visitors. They think everybody who wasn't born and raised here is a city slicker. Not much happens in Stucky besides the annual Fireman's Festival and a whole lot of gossip. I wasn't thrilled about moving back, but boy, things have changed a lot since the last time I was here. Uncle Charles passed away almost four months ago. Before you start feeling sorry about it, let me stop you right there. I don't care if people say how great he was now that he's gone, but he was not well loved and he did not have the biggest heart you ever met. That's bullshit unless you count the cholesterol that swelled up his arteries and gave him those heart attacks. He was a mean man and an ignorant racist. Most folks around here are. That's why I moved away and it's the reason I regret keeping this place and not selling it. Sight unseen. One reason, at least. He was a proud member of a certain organization of white-hooded men with a penchant for violence. A lust, even. You know the ones, I mean. The ones who proclaim to know the problem and claim to have the solution to society's woes. The tough-as-nails men who declare that their love of their Baptist Lord will protect them from evil. I ain't afraid of nothing, they say. Which is why they keep a rack in the back window of their American-made pickup trucks loaded with shotguns and rifles and antlers. They claim those guns are only for hunting, and yes, sometimes. Don't mind the pistol in their glove box and the full racks in my parking lot before church every Sunday morning. In case you didn't know, hunting ain't allowed on Sunday because that's the Lord's day. By the way, if you visit on a Sunday morning, park out front, if you don't mind. Truth is, you might not want to visit, I've seen some shit that might make you want to stay as far away as possible. And Travis stabbing Andy in the neck is only the beginning. As usual, I was working that night when I heard some voices start getting too loud somewhere in the bar. By the time I figured out where the ruckus was, it was too late. Andy's neck was already squirting blood, spraying it everywhere like some kind of demonic super soaker. It looked like a grotesque garden hose. I always thought the way it looked in a film was fake, how it pulses and shoots out that much, and so far. The truth is, the sight of it is worse than what you see in a movie. If movies looked the way Andy's neck looked, people might think it was too exaggerated and it wouldn't look real enough. It looked like a goddamn water sprinkler. Or, I guess a blood sprinkler except it didn't have that sound. You know the sound. Tick, 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 tick as it goes around and then taka 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 back the other way. The worst part is, Travis didn't even offer to pay for the ruined felt on the pool table. He told me it's Andy's blood and that it's Andy's fault, and I said, well, Andy's dead and his wife ain't got the money to replace it. And he said, are you putting me on Patty's list? 
or can I get another beer? So now I gotta listen to all of them complain about the crusty brown spots that dried up before I could get the goddamn mess cleaned off the pool table. There wasn't any good to come from putting him on the list. It would piss everybody off, and they barely tolerated me already, and that's only because I grew up here. It's also the reason I don't need to hear the whispers of gossip, to know what they say about me behind my back. So now, when they complain, I tell them to take it up with Travis or suck it up and shut the hell up. And when they start getting bent out of shape about that, I just tell them to go ahead and quiet down because I know their mama, and she didn't raise a delicate little whiny baby, which I think earns me a little respect with them. In case you didn't know, Travis is the only deputy in the county, so no, nobody called the cops. A couple fellas dragged Andy outside and got him up in the back of Drew's pickup truck. Jerry drove since he was the least drunk, and they hauled ass for the hospital cutting across Joey's field to get him there as fast as possible. That shortcut backfired. They cut across the ditch down Weems Bottom because the road is so narrow and curvy you can't see headlights until they're right on top of you. At first, that seemed like a perfect plan, so Jerry gave it a little more and gunned it with Drew egging him on the whole way. You can't repeat any of this, by the way. The person who told me swore they wouldn't tell anybody. He did me a favor since it happened in my bar, so I can't tell you who it was. Anyway, I guess Jerry got the F-250 up to about 50 miles an hour, and he was handling it fine, so he gave it more. I suspect he was more worried about showing off to Drew and his buddies in the back than he was about Andy. So when Jerry gassed it, they said the whole crew in the back all leaned at the same time, with Drew hollering, all of them in back like a bunch of chickens watching a fox creeping closer to the coop. No shit, Sherlock. That's called physics. So Jerry was doing 50 and gunned the engine and they all leaned back and they laughed. But they weren't laughing for long because Jerry was going too fast to stop in time when he saw the texture of the field up ahead. He hit the brakes but it didn't matter. And they rolled into the part of the field that was freshly rough plowed. See, Joe has several fields, this being the biggest and it takes at least two days to plow, so the field was only half plowed. What that meant for them was the field was hard packed, and it was fine that Jerry tore ass through it with Andy bouncing around in the bed of the truck. I imagine it was too dark to see the tractor out there, but even if they had, they couldn't have seen where Joe had left off plowing. If you've never seen a rough plowed field at night, it looks like the ocean does when you're standing on a fishing pier. Long parallel swells, lined up one after another, Swell after swell after swell, except it's too dark to tell how big they are. Jerry was lucky he hadn't already capsized Drew's pickup, and I guess the rest of them were lucky for that too. It could have been worse, but it was real bad. When Jerry slammed Drew's pickup into the first row of rough plow, it set off a field dirt explosion. The steel bumper cut through the upper half of the swell like a blue whale had surfaced and sent soil spraying everywhere. The crew in the back didn't know what had happened. They heard a sudden loud bang, but that was it. They didn't even have time to hold on to anything. Next thing they knew, they were floating in a cloud of field dust, and the whole world had gone slow motion and silent. When the rear wheels went over the rest of the swell, the pickup bed had kicked up like a mule's ass. It launched all five of them, plus Andy, who had been unconscious for a full minute already, into the air. Like threatened chickens, all their faces contorted at the same time into confused looks of fear. Tough as nails and ain't afraid of nothing. Huh. Yay, right. I suppose they were lucky they didn't know what happened until it was over, because I doubt any of them had a fierce enough faith in their lord to sign up on purpose for this particular ride and to believe they wouldn't get injured or die. But that is the ride they got, and they found out that physics will hurt them and that nature will not care even if Baptist Jesus did. They got hurt pretty bad and they crashed to the ground in a heap and you could hear their bones cracking and breaking everywhere, a couple of them screaming in pain and the rest were only quiet because they were unconscious. Aaron's still in the hospital now, but I think he's getting out later this week. Andy died, but he might have already been dead by then, it's hard to say. The rest were pretty beat up and bruised. One had a concussion, but I don't know who. Keith only got a bloody nose, but it took two days until it stopped bleeding completely. Both his eyes still have big, swollen, purple rings around them. Jerry broke both his legs when the truck slammed to a stop after bouncing over one more swell. 
The second swell sent the truck nearly vertical, and it crashed down like a head-on impact. All that weight crushed the front end and smashed the steering wheel and dashboard into his lap, cracked both his thigh bones in half. They said you could see both bones outside his body. The jagged femurs tore through his muscle and straight through his jeans, sticking out. When the paramedics started working on him, he didn't understand what happened to him or who they were. So when they tried cutting off his pants to help him, he was fighting. I guess he was trying to run away or to kick them away. Whatever he was trying to do didn't work because his lower leg bones weren't attached to the rest of his leg, except by meat. So while he kicked and ran, his feet just laid there at odd angles, not moving. His thigh bones moved though. They moved around every which way, pointing in all different directions. When he tried to run, it looked like his skeleton aimed to spear one of the first responders. Drew was tossed out the passenger side window and somehow walked away with nothing more than some scrapes and bruises. But Chuck? Chuck got the worst of it, or maybe the best considering what happened to him. He died in the field, with his brains leaking out of his skull because his head landed directly on a large rock, which is very unfortunate. You don't find rocks like that in the middle of a field usually. This happened on my second night back home. Ah yes, good old Stucky. All that because Travis was mad that his wife Stephanie had gone to prom with Andy in the 11th grade. Since then, things have slowed down around here, and if it keeps going like this, I don't know if I can keep Jesse and Stachia busy with work. Stachia is out front right now, and I'm in my office writing this. With business being slow, I gave Jesse the night off work. We're up to three orders of wings and ten liver plates. It's 8.30 p.m., and that's it so far. It's Tuesday, but usually we would have three times these sales. Folks here love our chicken livers, but you know what they don't like? I mean, besides come here's and people with brown skin? Devil worshippers, that's what. Ever since the night Travis stabbed Andy in the neck, things keep happening and it's got everybody on edge. There's whispers about a satanic cult and sacrifices. I admit, things have gotten strange, but I'm certain it isn't some satanic cult or whatever. And I'm sure it isn't Liz. Liz is Andy's wife, well, his widow now, I guess. After he died, she began wearing all black all the time. Only black. Which I'm sure is her way to mourn. But you know how people love to talk. After the goats, it didn't take long for folks to start giving her the old stink eye and whispering about how she's summoning the devil to get revenge on Travis. I suppose I understand why she'd want revenge. Still, she's too small to wrestle with a live goat lift it onto a truck roof and cut its throat, especially while holding it there to bleed out. I'm not a huge guy, but I'm a lot stronger than her, I'm sure. When I helped those guys get the goats off the roof, it was no easy task, even coming down. Getting one up there would be too much for her. Three. Well, Liz couldn't do it alone, that's for sure. The goats weren't the first thing to happen. No one noticed until later the pattern that tied the events together. Once people saw the goats, they started putting together the bigger picture of what was going on. Assuming all these things are related and let's get real, they are. First, it was the two turtles. Looking back, I'd bet there were three and something dragged one of them off and ate it. Plus, no one thought to check the turtles' mouths. Next thing was Derek's sheep. He said he woke up that morning and found it stone cold dead in the barn. Somebody had cut its throat, cut the tongue out of its mouth, and removed both eyes. Then, they braided together some weeds and tied them around its snout, like a strange binding. Its mouth was filled with cowrie shells. Then it was the goats. It was my day off, or at least that's what I call it so I can pretend. Truth is, this bar takes up most of my time. Usually I try not to work very much on Wednesday and let Stakia and Jesse handle things. I needed to catch up on some of my paperwork, so I came in around 3 p.m., worked in the office for a few hours, and left around 7. Then, around 11 o'clock, I got a call from Stakia. Hello? Hey, Seb? You out to get down here? Quick? Stakia? Seb. Okay, all right, what's going on? Goats. Goats? Yeah, goats. You remember Franny, right? Franny? I couldn't think of anyone named Franny. Who? Derek's sheep. Franny. I imagined I could hear her rolling her eyes at me over the phone. Right, yes, I remember Derek's sheep. I didn't know her name. She cut me off. 
Well, it happened again, except it's goats. Somebody killed goats? Yes, Seb. That's what I'm trying to tell you. She hadn't said so, but I knew she meant someone killed the goats at my bar. I liked seeing Stakia get herself worked up. So what does that have to do with me? Seb, they sacrificed the goats here, in Curtis' parking lot. How many? I don't know, two or three, what's it matter? You're right, Jesus Christ, okay, let me get cleaned up, I'll be right there. You better hurry. Drew already took off looking for whoever did it and Eddie's demanding to see the video. Should I show it to him? I'd been meaning to get around to those cameras. Shit. Seb, tell me you got the cameras situated. It's on my list. Oh, for fuck's sake, you and that list. Have you seen Travis? Nobody knows where he is. I called him and it went straight to voicemail. I sent him a message, but you know how he is. He won't check those texts until next week. Eddie and Bill said they were going to ride by his house real quick to see if he's home. Okay, tell everybody to hold their horses and calm down until I get there. I'll be quick. Oh, they won't act up, they know better. Yeah, why is that? Because they know if they step out of line, I'll make them look like one of these goats. She laughed, but I didn't think she was joking. You're the best. Be there soon. All right, Seb. Bye. Bye. I had almost hung up when I had another thought. Stakia? Yeah. You haven't seen Liz around today, have you? Andy's wife? You know that kooky lady doesn't come in here. Okay, good. Do me a favor and take a lot of pictures, would you? I want Travis to see this. You don't need to worry about that. Half the damn town is in the parking lot snapping pictures. Christ, already. I told you to hurry up. Don't blame me. I'll be right there. I got there at about 11 p.m. and when I arrived, there were about 30 people milling around in the parking lot. Everybody was taking pictures and discussing what or who killed the goats. As soon as I set foot outside my car, I heard Jimmy and Daryl arguing with each other about the killer. It wasn't no satanic cult. I'm telling you, Jimmy, this is exactly what the goat man does. This is the doings of Chupacabra. That doesn't even make any sense, dumbass. Jimmy was poking his finger in Daryl's chest. These two weren't playing around. Goat man ain't real. Satanic cults are real. Daryl was right up in Jimmy's face now, almost shouting. Hell if it ain't real. Are you stupid? Jimmy asked. Have you ever seen a chupacabra? Have you ever seen a satanic cult? Countered Daryl. I've seen them on television. Well, I've seen a chupacabra on TV too, and I'm telling you, Jimmy, this, Daryl swept his arm wide to gesture at the scene in the parking lot, is what they do. I figured I should break it up before things got too serious. The last thing I needed was for people to have a fistfight in my parking lot about what had brutalized the goats. If I'm being honest, though, my money was on the chupacabra. Ladies, come on now, break it up, I interjected. Why don't y'all get back to your sewing circle or wherever it is y'all go to avoid your family? Jimmy turned to me, squaring his shoulders up. Don't you tell me to leave. There's a satanic cult doing their devil worshipping right here in front of your bar. I got every right to be here. I ignored him and turned my attention to the crowd gathered under the yellow neon sign. All right, listen up. If y'all ain't here to clean up or to spend money, you got no business here. Go on, get going home now. Travis will be along any time. Y'all go home and let us handle it. I looked at Jimmy to see if we were going to have a problem. He started towards his vehicle, but not before he shot me daggers with a glare. As he walked off, I heard him muttering, Better watch your back, Seb. I scanned the crowd looking for Stakia and didn't see her. I spotted Jesse standing with Billy and Drew in front of Billy's pickup. I walked over to see what any of them might have found out. Eddie, Bill, ain't this about a bitch, huh? Eddie wasted no time. You better tell me you got some damn video, Seb. Look at this shit. He pointed to the goat. The goat sprawled across the roof on its belly and its front hooves spread to each side. Congealing blood painted the windshield a reddish-brown opaque of thick streams. What a fucking mess. The inside of its throat was visible through the enormous gash that began and ended near its ears. Red droplets of blood dripped off the ragged edges of flesh, 
from the yellow-gray-pink cartilage, tissue, and bone. It looked like a bizarre, organic sculpture. Whoever did it had wrestled the goat onto the roof, stretched it out with its head back, and then let it rip. The eye sockets were gruesome, two dark cavities where they removed the eyes. I could see inside its head. A tangled knot of braided honeysuckle vines interlaced its horns and dangled into the empty holes. I didn't want to tell him. I knew there should be working cameras. I ignored Ed and looked at Jesse instead. Statia inside? Y'all okay? Jesse shrugged and curled his lip into a sarcastic smile. Yeah, I guess we're okay, but this is... He trailed off with wide eyes and just shook his head. You mind getting Stachia for me? We need to figure some things out. Jesse nodded and went inside, weaving his way through the exiting traffic. The headlights from the vehicles cast shadows through the parking lot that looked too long and too dark. Every stray clod or piece of gravel looked out of place. The flicker of the neon overhead didn't help, nor did the intermittent buzz of cicadas in dissonant harmony with Grandpa's old sign. Bill stood with his arms crossed, the man's chest was so big it looked like he had to fight to get them to stay crossed. Have either of y'all talked to Travis? Anybody know where he is? Bill remained motionless and silent. He had that look that said, This whole thing is fucked, and you might be from here, but you ain't from here like we are. Of course, he didn't say it, but I knew he was thinking it, and I knew he was right. Eddie, you know I'll be straight with you. I got the cameras installed, but I haven't gotten them connected yet. There's no video. That pissed him off and Eddie charged straight in, chest first. I couldn't even tell you all the things he said, but there was a lot of, you motherfucker this and you motherfucker that. I put my hands up to say whoa and looked to the side. I understood he was angry. I understood he needed to open the steam valve and relieve some of the pressure, so I stood my ground and let him vent. I was careful not to fuel the fire though. The whole town was on edge by then, and I didn't want him to escalate it. Eventually, he ran out of gas and turned away, kicking the dirt, hands on the waist of his faded Lee jeans. God damn it, Seb. Eddie, listen. It would be nice to have video, it would. But right now, we gotta get this cleaned up, and we need to get a hold of Travis. Bill finally spoke up. Nobody's heard anything from him. Me and Eddie ran down past his house to see if he was home, but he wasn't. Was Stephanie there? Yeah, she was there. She's worried told us she hadn't heard from him since lunchtime. Stachia walked up with her arms crossed and bumped Bill, shoulder to shoulder. If Bill looked like security at a country concert, Stachia looked the opposite of that. Small, meek, and like she'd caught a chill. It was out of character for her. Hey, Stachia, you got it handled, I see. I don't get paid enough to handle a goddamn goat sacrifice. I know you don't. I'll see what I can figure out. I appreciate you. What the hell are you going to figure out? You know a good exorcist? She pinched her nose and screwed her face up. Christ, that thing stinks. People like to describe Stachia as a firecracker, and this was a moment when you understood why. There was something about her deadpan delivery that made everything she said humorous. Even the rude remarks, which was most of them. I would have been able to hold it in, except I saw Bill looking away down at his boots trying to hide a smile. The pressure had built up and when I saw him, that chuckle took hold and I cracked and started laughing. Then Stachia and Bill cracked, so the three of us stood there laughing so hard we cried. Right in front of Eddie's truck with the dead goat still bleeding all over the windshield. Laughing while blood oozed into Eddie's wipers and down his fenders. Laughing through the sharp smell of goat shit and dead farm animals in the air laughing in the sickly glow of decades-old yellow neon, and seeing Eddie's face didn't help things. He paced back and forth and glared at the three of us laughing like he wanted to twist all our heads off. When we were finished hosing off Bill and Eddie's trucks, we made a quick stop to wash up, and I offered to buy a round for everybody. We closed the bar, but Bill and Eddie stuck around with Stachia, Jesse, and me. I was glad they did, I still had some lingering questions about what people were saying with all that went on. Drew, for one. He was gone when I got here and I hadn't heard anything from him, so I didn't know what frame of mind he was in. I knew Eddie would be pissed, but I also knew it wasn't anything I couldn't handle. 
and I don't think I'd ever seen Billy mad enough to even raise his voice. Drew, though, he was one of Travis's lackeys, but he had a clear black streak in him. We grew up together, and as teenagers, I got to see some of the things that he derived joy from, and none of it was something you'd brag to your mother about over dinner. He was a bully, plain and simple. Travis wasn't exactly a shining example of sainthood either, but there was something darker inside Drew. People knew it as soon as they met him, just like with Andy a few weeks ago. Now I understand hightailing it to the hospital to try and save a man's life. From what everybody said, Drew seemed almost like he was trying to bounce Andy out of the truck. He didn't mean to total his truck like that, but I don't know many people who'd be whooping and hollering and having a grand time that way when your friend is bleeding to death in the back. Plus, Drew ran with Travis, but he had his own little group of lackeys too. They weren't the type of guys you wanted to get on their bad side. Once everybody was settled in, I brought over a tin beer bucket with eight or nine beers covered in ice and dropped it on the table. Y'all help yourself. I cracked one open and downed half the bottle in one go. 90s country still played from the jukebox and nobody said a word for the first few minutes. I imagined they were letting this moment cover over the last couple hours everyone had endured. If we were betting on who'd be the first one to break the silence, my money would be on Stakia. She's too high-spirited and social to sit still for long without some kind of stimulation. I would have lost my money on that bet because Jesse spoke up first. He was usually pretty quiet, so when he spoke, you knew he had something to say. Where's Drew? Anybody know? Seemed like Jesse and I might share some of the same concerns about Drew. Stakia piped up and said, If I know anything about Drew, he's probably loaded up with crosses and kerosene for anybody who isn't a member of Divinity. Stakia was referring to Divinity Baptist Church. It was the church most folks attended, unless you were Catholic or Methodist, or a devil worshiper, which to most of the congregation who worshipped there was everybody who didn't said he was going to round up his boys. It sounded like he meant to turn it into a posse, if you catch my meaning. I caught Eddie's meaning, I expected this. Bill joined in and said, first thing we should do is find Travis. It's not like him to keep his phone off. Even his wife doesn't know where he went. If Drew gets those guys all rung up and bloodthirsty, Travis will show up at the front of that crew. We all know what happened with Andy. It was obvious Eddie had heard the gossip too. Everybody had. Travis isn't here to keep any of us safe. He had a point. Eddie, you might be right, but we still ought to find Travis if we can. And Bill, why don't you give the office a call in the morning to see if they've heard from him? Seb, Travis doesn't check in but once a week with them. What good's that going to do? I know he doesn't, Bill. But look, we got three dead goats rotting in my dumpster right now. Drew and his white knights are probably roaming around stirring up all kinds of havoc right now. And if we call the law above Travis, they're just going to point us to him. Unless we have a good reason why that ain't good enough. I was surprised that Bill didn't buck back. Stacia, can you give the district office a call in the morning and see if they've heard from Travis? Did you really think I wasn't already? Atta girl, is that okay by you, Bill? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Still, I'm telling y'all, watch out for Travis. Half the town is already blaming Liz and you know how this stuff goes. If Travis sees the opportunity to pick on that woman and get his way at the same time. Bill wasn't wrong. Travis had been gunning for the title of sheriff for quite some time. And if he had a sense this could help him achieve that, he wouldn't care who he tore up to get it. If Travis identified a cult and took them down, he'd secure that position without a doubt all part of the plan. We need to report the goats. He's going to hear about it anyway, and I'd rather not be on the wrong side of him and his men when they try and track down whoever it is. Can you do that, Stachia? Might as well, I left him a couple messages already. Bang, bang, bang. We all jumped, but Jesse was halfway to the front door by the time the rest of us even thought to check. He put his eye to the peephole, then turned around. It's Drew. Anybody else, I asked. He looked again, then shook his head. I waved for Jesse to let Drew in and he cranked the deadbolt. It opened with a click, then the door flew inward, all the way, and slammed the wall with a thud. 
Drew stomped in with three other men. Drew wasted no time. You got some shit security here, Peabody, but we already knew that, didn't we? Hi, Drew. What can I do for you? I asked. I want the video of that bitch Lee's when she slaughtered those goats all over your parking lot and my truck. We can talk about the evidence after I talk to Travis. I glanced at Eddie, wondering if he was going to speak up. I knew he wasn't happy about the lack of video, but I had my fingers crossed he wouldn't blurt it out. Not yet, at least. You haven't talked to him yet? Drew sounded confused. Maybe Drew was as clueless as we were about Travis's whereabouts. No, I haven't. Stacia already called him before she called me. I got down here as quick as I could, and we haven't heard from him. We thought maybe you knew where he was. Snap. Well, I haven't talked to Travis, but I already know it was that fucking witch. She's not a witch, Drew. Just relax. I cut him off before he could go any further, but he was determined. She is a fucking witch, and we got proof. Show him the video. He gestured to one of the men who had come in with him. One of them I had never seen before. He was short, but he was as wide as his height. The other two I thought I recognized, but I didn't know any of their names. A tall, thin man spoke up. I don't have it. Drew turned to him. What do you mean you don't have it? The tall, thin man said, I don't have it with me. It's on my girl's phone. It doesn't matter. Drew turned back to me. Listen here. We got video of that bitch doing her devil worshipping. Video proof and I want the video of her and them goats. Did you see the goats, Drew? That woman is mourning her husband, that widow. She's not cutting up goats on your truck. She can't even lift a goat by herself. Exactly. Drew had been waiting for it, and I walked right into the trap. That's why you are going to give me the video, because I want to know who else was with her. He looked at his guys. Isn't that right, fellas? All four of them started towards us, and I stood up motioning for everyone to keep back. I met Drew midway to the door. I saw that sadistic look in his eye, just like in high school. Drew, you'll get all the evidence I have after I talk to Travis. How about we just take it? Listen, Drew, I understand you're upset and you got a right to be mad. Taking it out on me isn't going to help anything. You understand? Let me talk to... He shoved me hard. I stumbled back a couple paces and lost my footing before landing flat on my ass. Drew stepped towards me with the tall, skinny guy right behind him, and Bill dropped both of them. You'd never know it to look at him, but Bill was lightning fast. He threw a left hook, then a right hook. His first punch caught Drew on the chin, and I watched his knees wobble back and forth a second before he collapsed on the floor. Bill's other fist hit the taller one in his ear, and he went stiff as board and fell flat too. Eddie and Jesse were on their feet, too, when the stocky man reached around his waistband and aimed a pistol at them. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Eddie showed his palms to the guy. Look, it ain't gotta be like that. Why don't you go ahead and put that pop gun away? Why don't you shut the fuck up? Just give us the video and we're all good. Eddie and Jesse exchanged a look. They stood by the table with the bucket of beers. Bill stood next to me. I was still on my back, but I had to do something. I didn't know if I should just come clean about the video or if that would make matters worse. It turned out not to matter because Staxia appeared out of the office and threw a CD case on the ground at his feet, then chambered a shell in the shotgun she was carrying. I hadn't even seen her leave. Good old Stachia. There, that's all you're gonna get unless you want a chest full of buckshot. And trust me, that little pony you're packing ain't gonna stop me from pulling the trigger on this cannon. So I suggest you put it back in your little tidy whities take that disc and drag them two on out of here. Plus, you're on Patty's list now, so don't bother coming back, you fucking dill hole. He looked at the guy still standing, then back at Stachia. You're a little scrapper, ain't ya? I think we all probably pissed a little when Stachia fired around into the ceiling. She racked another shell in place and stepped forward. You got something else to say, dickwad? Get the fuck out of here right now or the next one is for you. Okay now, take it easy. Look, we're just trying to keep our neighbors safe, that's all. He held one hand out and put his gun back in his waistband with the other. I can see you mean business. We'll go. We're going, okay? We're leaving. 
Stagia kept the shotgun trained on him while he and his buddy got Drew and the skinny one up off the floor. Bill took a spot next to me and crossed his arms, like he'd done outside earlier with Eddie. Once they'd left, no one felt much like drinking, so I put the beers away and we called it a night. We agreed to meet tomorrow and share whatever we could find out from the gossip mill. It was clear Drew was rounding up for a literal witch hunt. We had to keep a close eye on him to be sure nothing got too out of hand. My phone rang early the following afternoon and woke me up. I felt sharp and rested. Hello? It's Stasia. Hey, any news yet? I called the department and no one there had heard anything from Travis, so I called Stephanie. She's worried sick. He's missing. Are you at the bar? No, I'm getting ready. I wanted to call you first. Are we open tonight? I don't see why we wouldn't be. Um, bloody sacrifices, satanic rituals, a missing deputy, not to mention Drew and his white knights. Any of that ring a bell? I'm aware, you okay working? You know it. Good, see you in a bit. Hey Seb, I wanted to ask you about something else. Sure, what is it? Jesse, what about him? He left work yesterday. And? And he's the one who found the mess in our parking lot. He said he'd just got back and found them like that. You think my cousin Jesse did this? Shit. He's your cousin I really didn't know. The timing just seemed a little weird was all. I'm sorry, I didn't mean any harm by it. She wasn't wrong about the timing. You're fine, Stachia. No offense taken. I'm sure Jesse will get a kick out of it. Oh, come on, Seb. Please don't tell him I said anything. Just yanking your chain, I won't say a word. I'll see you in a bit. After we hung up, I sent Eddie and Bill a message asking them to come by later tonight. Now that Travis was officially missing and the White Knights ready with their torches, we needed a plan. It was a quiet night at the House of Ill Repute until Drew showed up. He came in with six more men in tow. They perched up around the pool table and ordered a few pitchers of beer. The lanky guy from the night before was with them, but the stocky one who Stachia put on Patty's list was notably absent. My guess was it had more to do with Drew's reasoning and less to do with abiding by Stachia's word. They didn't seem to be there to cause trouble, but I told Jesse and Stachia to help me keep a close eye on them. After last night, I had no doubts in my mind that they were motivated by more than just a friendly visit. More folks filtered in over the next hour or so, including Eddie and Bill. Before long, the house of ill repute was standing room only, which was great for my bottom line, but I suspected this had more to do with whatever Drew was up to. They sat at the far end of the bar, wary of the white knights. You're really letting them in here after what happened? Asked Eddie. I looked at Bill. How's your knuckles? Good as ever. They know better, chimed Stakia as she hustled past us with two pitchers of beer in each hand. She called back over her shoulder, loudly enough for the entire bar to hear her. I got a brand new box of shells for that Mossberg. See, Eddie? Everything's fine. He didn't look convinced. It didn't take long to find out what they were up to. Drew had invited the crowd to meet him so he could share some news. To brag was more like it, I thought. They had gone mostly quiet and stood in a few different groups. Each group stood hunched in a semi-circle, watching something on a phone, while Drew boasted about harassing Liz last night. It sounded like they continued their witch hunt after they left. We stopped in to give Seb a neighborly warning, but he didn't want to hear us out. We were going to show him the video too, but Dave didn't have his wife's phone with him. I admit, we were upset and things went a little too far, but y'all can see why we were so upset. This could turn bad. I approached the group to find out what they were up to. What are you doing, Drew? You trying to have yourself scraped off Curtis's floor again? No, sir, not at all. There was too much respect in his tone to think it was genuine. I learned my lesson. It's just that I care about this town and about my neighbors. The way things left off between us made me think we had a big misunderstanding, Seb. I wanted to come by so you could see the video yourself and to make things right to bury the hatchet. I didn't like where this was headed and that's mighty big of you. Maybe you're right, maybe it was all just a misunderstanding. Let's see what you have here. 
Right then, a couple of the guests gasped and a couple more looked away from the video in disgust. One of the men pointed at his phone. See, right there, it's devil worship. A murmur ran through the crowd and I could sense their agitation and discomfort. Show me the video, Drew. I called back to Eddie and Bill. You fellas ought to get over. Come on, come look. Drew isn't causing any trouble. I turned back to Drew and cocked an eyebrow, giving him a deadpan look. Are you? No, sir, no trouble. Just being a caring neighbor, y'all need to see this. Drew started the video and we watched from the beginning. It was shaky and dark, but it was clear enough to tell it was taken from behind an old pile of brush. Through the scattered twigs and branches, you could see a woman dressed in loose black clothing, kneeling on the lawn of Wicomico Church, next to a crate. Wicomico Church was a small white building with clapboard siding. Over time, the few old grave markers that sat at the back of the property had shifted and settled, and now resembled a line of rotting, crooked teeth. There was no sign out front of the church, and nothing to display the service times or hours of worship. The only indication at all that it was a church was the steeple, a silent brass bell that hung there, and a solid black cross painted on the front door. A large locust tree grew beside the building, shading the church's only window. The woman stood, and remaining in place turned fully around, scattering something in a circle at her feet. I couldn't see clearly in the video, but it looked like small pebbles. I had a hunch. It was cowrie shells. The woman then shrugged off her robe and stood with her back to the camera, entirely nude. She raised her palms and looked up, then knelt again and placed her palms flat to the earth. She repeated the same gestures two more times, then stood unmoving for several seconds before reaching into the crate that sat just outside of the circle. She removed a chicken and held it out with one hand gripping the bird by its neck, then reached for something at her feet. When she stood again, I could see she held a long knife with a thin, curved blade. She repeated the ritual of standing and kneeling again, this time holding the bird and the knife up as if she was presenting it to someone or something. After she knelt and placed the chicken and the knife flat on the ground for the third time, she stood again, holding the bird directly overhead. In one swift motion, she sliced its throat. The bird twitched and flapped and a cloud of feathers exploded out of it, but she kept a tight grip on it, holding it above her while its blood gushed out all over her. She held the knife up high and tilted her head back, allowing the blood to pour down over her face. She stood like that for several minutes and when the blood stopped flowing from the chicken, she tossed it aside and turned around looking straight at the camera. That's where the video ended. I couldn't say with any certainty who the woman was, it was too dark to tell if it was Liz, but Drew and his crew told everyone they had been keeping tabs on her while they looked for Travis. They had followed her to Wicomico Church, and they all swore it was Liz in the video. This would not end well for the widow. Listen, the first thing we need to do is locate Travis. Not even his wife or the department knows where he is. I tried logic to calm them down, and it immediately backfired. Drew saw his opportunity and pounced. If you ask me, we ought to start by asking the witch where he is. Seb, I know you mean, well? He was still putting on his fake front of respect, and it made me want to rip his face off. He continued, But didn't you watch the same thing we just watched? Something's got to be done before it's too late. We can't wait around for Travis to come save us because Travis might be waiting for us to save him. And this brought nods and chatter from the rest of the group agreeing that something needed to be done right away. One of them shouted, Let's go get Travis! Folks were on their feet and headed out the door with a screech of bar stools on the plank wood floor. Drew wore a smug look and stared me down. Looks like folks are choosing sides, Seb. Don't be stupid and end up on the wrong one. Once Stashia got the tab settled, everyone cleared out and we found ourselves alone in the bar again, just like the night before. I helped Jesse clean the kitchen and listened in on Bill and Eddie talking at the bar. I was curious what they thought after seeing that video. I believed Drew about the woman in the video. Drew didn't have any reason that I knew of to gun for Liz so hard, except if he truly believed she was a devil worshiper. It looked like Liz to me, Eddie. That doesn't explain how she got those goats up on the roof without some help. Fuck Seb should have had working cameras. 
Eddie nodded. True. Maybe Drew's right about there being a cult. She poured chicken blood all over herself. Whether it's Liz or not, that looked like devil worship to me and it happened right there at Wacomico Church. Maybe. Still, it doesn't give anybody the right to harm the woman or anybody else. They need to let the law handle it, said Bill. Stachia stayed quiet, cleaning the bar and getting ready to lock up for the night. Eddie said quietly, yeah, if there was anybody around to uphold the law. I didn't sleep at all that night. After a shower, I decided to get a coffee from Rosie's. Rosie's Cafe was the only place in town where you could go out to eat breakfast, and the place was packed every morning except Sunday when they were closed. I never made it. Liz's house was on my way to the cafe, and there were a dozen or so vehicles parked along the road out front. A group of people stood in a circle in the lawn near the front porch. I parked and walked over to join them. Good morning, I said as I approached the group. The only reply I got was when a couple of them moved to the side and nodded towards the middle of the circle they had formed. It was Liz, or rather it was Liz's body. She was on her back, with her arms and legs sprawled wide, laying on the grass. It was clear by the wide patch of blood-stained grass under her that she had died tight here. Where her eyes should have been were wide, vacant cavities that had been stuffed with cowrie shells. Her throat had been slit, and her head was posed and tilted back, causing the wound to hang open, exposing the inside of her throat. A knot of braided honeysuckle had been stuffed into her throat, through her mouth so deeply that long vines of it spilled out from her throat and around her lips. Someone had drawn a large cross across her breasts and down the center of her chest by wiping away the blood that had drenched her torso. It was obvious whoever did this had posed her here on the front lawn, spread out and exposed this way to be sure people found her like this. The sheriff already called in the state boys, said they were sending the FBI to investigate and said not to touch anything. Not sure why you'd want to, I said. Who found her? A couple of Jamie's crew on their way to work said they stopped at Rosie's and grabbed coffee and a muffin or something quick, and this was on their way to the job site. They almost didn't stop because they figured it couldn't be what they thought they saw. They backed up just to double check, and sure enough, the man gestured to Liz's mutilated corpse. And still no word from Travis. He finished. This is gonna cause an uproar. Everybody was already acting itchy. But with Liz being found this way, I had no doubt there'd be a rally soon. Probably tonight. My suspicions were confirmed immediately. Goddamn right, as it should. We're gonna meet up in front of Divinity at 10 Awarn tonight. Be smart if you were there. The look he gave me was peculiar. I didn't know the man, but he seemed to know who I was. 10 no? I'll be there. I decided to skip Rosie's and headed straight to the bar instead. I called Bill on the way and let him know about Liz. You think Drew did it? He asked. No, I don't. I figured. Wouldn't make much sense, but it sure is a big coincidence that he got everybody riled up with that video last night, and here she is dead this morning. He told me that he and Eddie were planning to drive around the back roads looking for Travis's truck if he hadn't turned up. He'd already heard about Liz in the rally tonight, so he figured the only thing that might put out the fire was Travis's leadership, plus knowing he was still alive. We agreed to let each other know if anything new developed. When I got to ill repute, I called Jesse and asked him to meet me there, and he came right over. They're all planning to meet for a rally tonight at 10 p.m., I told him. All of them? Sounded like the whole was planning to be there, or the whole congregation at least. All this stuff about satanic rituals has them thirsty for blood? Asked Jesse. It's ironic. Jesse picked up the letter, pausing to make eye contact before he read it. The first time I had seen the letter was my first day as the new owner. The paperwork to execute my great uncle's will took nearly six weeks, and I had used that time preparing for the move. I waited until everything was finalized, just out of caution. I didn't want to make the move back, then find out later someone had a dispute with Uncle Charles's wishes. No one did and things went smoothly, so as soon as the papers were signed and the will had been executed, I loaded a moving van and drove to the bar. I had never heard anything about the letter, but when I got to Stucky, 
I could sense things were different. I just wasn't clear about what was different. I walked in to find the majority of my family here with Jesse, somber, waiting for me. Aunt Michelle handed me the letter saying, read this and you'll understand. At first, I had trouble comprehending the full weight of what I'd read. I was bitter, angry even. Then, my anger turned into motivation to undo it, to rid our family of the curse. I moved out of Stucky a month before I turned 18, and I'd never been back, even to visit. As the letter explained, our family had a curse vexed upon us decades ago, but it didn't affect the children. Up until the age of 19, I had been safe from the spell, and apparently I was too far from Stucky to have ever been affected by it. From what I could gather, no one else in the family knew the effect distance had since on one else had moved that far from home before me. I assumed the family's inability to discuss the curse was a measure taken by my great-grandmother to prevent the spell from being Andoni. All I knew about it, all anyone knew about the curse was exactly what was in the letter Jesse reread. The letter I read my first day back here. My great-grandmother was so motivated by her need. One see letter at end of text, for revenge that she sought out and found dark magic rituals capable of such a spell. She wasn't the only one who thought to seek such magic, and I dove into numerous books about the subject. By sheer chance, I lucked across an entry that mentioned, only in passing, a surname that I recognized. I chased that rabbit down the hole and discovered she was a founding member of a local church here in Stuckey. Elizabeth Mackey was her given name until her vows and holy union to Benjamin Eli Wicomico. Elizabeth Mackey became Elizabeth Wicomico, and later a founding member of Wicomico Church. When Jesse finished reading the letter, he handed back and asked, You going to the rally? I think we should both go. He nodded, and we said no more about it. I called Stakia to tell her the bar would be closed tonight. Word had already spread, and she knew about Liz and the rally, too. Are you planning to go? I asked her. Hell no, Seb. I thought you knew me better than that. Hey, don't get mad. There's a lot going on lately, and I was just curious. No, I'm not participating in a rally of the White Knights. Not a chance. Think you could do me a favor. Can you watch the bar tonight? I'm concerned about what happens if things get out of hand. Wait, you're not going, are you? Jesse and I both... Are you out of your mind? You know what they're going to do, don't you? I do, yes, which is exactly why I want to be there. I'm not planning to participate, Stasia. I thought you knew me better than that. I smiled. Shut up. Yes, fine. I'll watch it for you. But you need to pay me a normal wage. I doubt the White Knights are going to tip very well if they show up with torches, and I have to light them up with buckshot. Fair enough. Is $200 good? She didn't hesitate for a second. $300, Stachia's trademark attitude. 250 just pay yourself out of the till, good? Yeah, we're good, be safe tonight. You too, help yourself to anything you want, okay? I appreciate you. You know I will anyway. She really was a firecracker. I let Jesse know I was leaving and asked him to wait until Stachia got there. Then I went home to get some rest. I wanted to be sharp and ready for the night ahead. I was optimistic our curse would be over soon. If things went according to plan, Curtis's house of ill repute would be filled with family and the sounds of celebration and laughter later. We had a huge feast planned, and I was so excited that I doubted I'd be able to nap, but I needed to try. <sighs> the vines wound around his wrists, cuffing them behind his back before wrapping around his waist, ankles, and legs. His knees were bent until his heels rested on his buttocks, and the braids wrapped and knotted around his thighs, holding his feet there. His neck was wrapped tightly and he hung suspended from the stout limb of the locust tree, faced to the single window of Wicomico Church. From the empty sockets where his eyes once were, a flourish of the same flora sprung out, pointing in different directions. The same from his mouth, making it look like he had vomited the tangled greenery onto himself. His chest was solid red, with the exception of the shape of a cross where the blood had been wiped away, and the gash in his neck looked like a wide maw due to his weight pulling and stretching the slash down and open. From it, 
an abundance of cowrie shells overflowed and spilled down his front. Most littered the ground below him, but some had caught and stuck to the blood that coated his entire torso. He smelled floral and sweet, like honeysuckle and decomposing flesh. His bowels had voided themselves, so he also smelled of piss and shit. How he had been posed was an obvious escalation. I wondered a little bit if Travis didn't deserve this fate after what he did to Andy. It didn't matter now. What was done was done. It was 8.45 and the rally would be soon. I tried to imagine the shit show to come, and especially when they saw Travis like this, but I couldn't even picture it. I texted Drew that I had found Travis's remains and only a few seconds passed before I got a reply. Remains? We comico, I replied. I didn't receive any more messages from him, but I knew he was already on the way. I turned to Jesse. Ready? He nodded, and we left for Divinity Baptist Church. We didn't have to wait long for people to start showing up. With the way gossip spread around Stucky, and with everything that had been going on, word of Travis's body being found that way spread through town faster than a fuse of dynamite. It was 9.30 and there were about 25 people there already when Drew rolled in. I counted eight men in the back of his truck, and all of them wore white hoods. All of them carried firearms, too. By 10 mountain p.m., Divinity Baptist Church was full beyond capacity. Every pew was full across the entire length. The hooded men that Drew had brought with him stood on the chancel brandishing their shotguns and rifles, and Drew stood at the lectern, proudly wearing his hood back so his face could be seen, and adjusted the flexible mic stand. Once he got it positioned, he addressed the crowd that had crammed into the church. Jesse and I watched from the tree line. There had to be close to 200 souls inside the church. This won't be easy. Are you sure you're okay with this? We can't be sure how it will go. I knew he was ready, but Jesse was family. It felt like the right thing to give him a chance to back out. Jesse nodded his agreement and Drew began to speak. First things, first, for anybody who ain't heard, we found Travis and it wasn't pretty. He was strung up in a tree outside Wicomico Church by those devil worshippers. We can be sure that there is a cult among us now, and you saw what they did to one of their own. Drew really played it up with fake respect. That poor widow did not deserve what they did to her, and I can only guess they did it to keep her quiet. Andy was a good man. So was his wife. But the devil is a tricky rascal. Just like Pastor Jones always said, Maybe she was seduced by the dark might of Satan, but she had a good soul and whatever happens, we should all remember that. What they did to Travis, well, it was heart-wrenching to see. I'm sure y'all have heard enough of the details already and I won't stand here in the Lord's house with a tongue so blasphemous as to relay here what it is that I saw, but I assure you, it was purely vile. The time for action is now. We must not let this darkness fester and take over our beloved town. This is not time for talking and this is not time for loving thy neighbor. This is a time for the righteous to cast out the wicked, and it is our duty, given by the Lord Almighty, our Savior in Christ, to oust this evil and see its end. You are here tonight. Did you come to watch a spectacle? Or did you come here with a loving Christian heart determined to beat back the enemy of God? He paused, letting his words sink in. The crowd shuffled antsy and growing uneasy with the cramped, humid church. Drew continued, I ask you again, my fellow brothers and sisters, are you here for the spectacle, or are you here to take the only reasonable just action? Are you prepared to fight these forces of evil with the love of our Almighty God in your hearts? Because I know I am, and if you aren't here for the Lord, then you. I had to give him credit. He really knew how to hype up a crowd. Then you, he continued, are the enemy of God. He pounded the podium and the microphone fell limply off to the side. The congregation of people stood, with a few whistles, and a chorus of, Amen. I nudged Jesse with my elbow and said simply, Let's go. It was the culmination of weeks of careful planning and coordination. Stachia had been right about Jesse and the goats. When she called me at home that day, I still had Travis blood on me. He was still alive then, but he put up a good fight. We knew they'd rally. We knew that, spurred on by the goats, by Liz, and especially by Travis, they would reveal the darkness in their hearts. 
And Drew was right. The members of tonight's congregation weren't there only for a spectacle, they were there for blood. They had their own dark desires and they wanted, not to watch them be fulfilled, but to partake in the bloodletting. It's the only reason this would work. They displayed their wickedness through their attendance, and that was exactly what I had planned for. Jesse grabbed the gas can, and we sprinted to the double doors of the church. They were already opened, like we'd anticipated, which made everything just slightly easier to pull off and get going before anyone inside could figure out what was happening and react. Jesse went through the doors and quickly splashed gasoline in the aisle, then retreated, leaving a line of fuel behind him. He chucked the entire can inside, leapt out of the way, and I slammed the double doors closed. Jesse fumbled for a second with the handcuffs we took from Travis, but got them cocked in time and slammed the cuffs on the large lever doorknobs to the church. Immediately, boots began kicking the door. I knew we didn't have much time and told Jesse to go. Move! Move! Go! I shouted. He jumped to the ground, skipping the three steps that led to the church doors, and I lit a match and tossed it at the puddle Jesse left on the small porch landing. That was all it took. The church doors erupted in flames and I heard the cries of whoever had been on the other side, crowding the doors, as the flames ignited their clothes and hair. So far things were going to plan. I stood back waiting ready for when the doors inevitably flew open. The fire wouldn't stop even half of them, but it would stop some, and it would slow a bunch of them down enough that we weren't facing all 200 of those evil people all at once. I looked around and saw Jesse hustling to the tree line. Perfect, just like we planned. The smell of melting polyester carpet, singed hair and burning flesh was accompanied by dozens of anguished screams inside. I heard the sounds of them trampling each other, fighting with each other to get out. It was music to my ears. Finally, a loud crack responded sharply from the doors and the panel of one door split open. I saw the orange glow of fire from the other side. It was only seconds before the damaged door erupted with bodies pouring out in a cloud of cucking smoke and smoldering clothing. Some tripped and fell, some were shoved to the ground by others, and several of them were left laying on the church floor unconscious. They were more concerned with their righteous revenge than they were about the lives of the other congregation members. The people. Jesse returned just as the first few exited the church, who seemed to still have their legs under them. Now, the fun began. It was time to feast. Jesse ran past me and grabbed a gray-haired woman who was on her hands and knees coughing and spitting up on the ground. She never saw him coming. He assumed his natural form just before he reached her. He barely paused as he passed her by, and reaching out, he flicked a singly sharp claw and tore open her throat. The blood gushed out so fast, it sounded like someone dumping a bucket of water in the grass. Before her smoky coughs became the bubbled sound of gurgling blood, he was on to the next one. Jesse was fierce. I didn't jump into the fray immediately. I watched as the other members of our family transmuted into the fanged, taloned, red-eyed creatures they are. We have always been a family of chupacabra, and soon our curse would be lifted. We swarmed in on the congregation, quickly killing the ones still distracted by the smoke and flames. We allowed our full, true nature to take over, allowed ourselves to be wild again. Blood sprayed everywhere as we bit into their faces, tore flesh away from bone and tore open their torsos with our claws. I saw Jesse reach into a man's abdomen with both hands, scooping out the organs inside, lifting them to his face and gorging on them. He must have sensed me watching because he yanked his head abruptly to look at me. As he turned, the intestines that dangled from his maw swung around, whipping his chin and leaving behind a splattered imprint. It didn't take long. We tore through them until they were all dead, every one of them. Then, with my chest heaving and still filled with bloodlust, I heard the distinct sound of a shotgun racking a shell into the chamber. It didn't matter if I could guess who it was or if I could smell her. I knew before I turned to see, it was Stachia. Don't you move, Seb, or I'll blow your fucking brains all over the fucking place. You fucking hear me, you sick fuck? Do you fucking hear me? I turned around slowly and raised my hands to show her I wasn't a threat. 
Stakia, you don't understand. I understand plenty and you're nothing but a sick fuck. Hmm. Stasia, listen to me. I don't want you to get hurt. Fuck you. You can't save these people. Shooting me won't save these people. Shut the fuck up. I could tell she was panicking. Who wouldn't be? The smell of blood in the air was enough to panic almost any mammal. She probably wasn't even aware she could smell it. Probably all she could smell was the tinfoil flavor of her own adrenaline. Stakia, listen to me. These were bad people. They wouldn't be dead otherwise. It was true. Before I could hunt at will. Once I came home and got infected by the curse, something happened inside, and I could only hunt those with an evil heart. What my great-grandmother did was so ironic it was nearly humorous. I'm not making it up. Yes, we are Chupacabra. You saw us in our true form. There's no denying that. But Stasia, you don't know the whole story. I liked Stakia and I hadn't wanted it to end like this. Why are you here anyway? Was it because of Jesse? She glanced at him and quickly looked away in disgust. He had resumed his human shape and still had bits of flesh and organ meat stuck to his chin and around his mouth. His entire face was red with blood. Listen, why don't you and I go back to the bar? I'll show you the letter. I'll explain everything. Us, the curse, all of it. Please, nobody here wants to hurt you. I pleaded with her and she let her guard down just a little. That was all it took, and Jesse was on her. He snatched the Mossberg out of her hands and tossed it away. Jesse eyed Stakia, then looked at me. I think she'll do just fine. Back at Curtis's house of ill repute, the sound of laughter and the clink of glasses pierced through the sound of the rolling stones, sympathy for the devil, as it blared from the jukebox. It felt like Thanksgiving, a Super Bowl party, and New Year's Eve all rolled into one. We had a huge meal prepared and it was time to celebrate. The bar only had one table big enough to seat a group of eight, and we used that to set up a buffet-style feast. In the center, we had placed the main course, Stachia. We put out a blanket and laid her out, stomach down and nude, with her ankles and wrists tied with honeysuckle behind her back. She struggled against the bindings and tried to scream, but we had crammed an apple into her mouth like a suckling pig. It came out sounding like a moan of desire. Later, we feasted on her. Stasia was as delicious as she was beautiful. 1. The Cursed Letter Dear family, as much as I hate you all for what you've done to my beloved Furman, I still love you at the same time. Why did you need to be so hateful? Why did the color of his skin matter so much when our love mattered so much more? You brought this on yourselves, and I will die without a morsel of guilt for this. But for the future generations who will grow continually weaker and weaker until this bloodline expires and dies, I want them to understand why. I loved Fermin, and he me. My father, upon realizing our love for one another, demanded I never see him again. I needed to know why, to understand. I don't care to repeat the words he chose. Fermin was Native American, not black anyway. But Daddy told me it's because Fermin isn't white and therefore has no place in our family. I wasn't willing to accept that, although I had no choice in the matter. Daddy made that much clear to me. So instead, Fermin and I continued to meet whenever we could by sneaking out at night. That lasted for several months until the night my brother followed me. How humiliating it was. My brother had grown suspicious and followed me to the secret place where Fermin and I would meet under the moon. That night was rather special as we both declared our love for one another. And then he showed me how much he loved me by kissing my special flower. I also showed Fermin how much I loved him by kissing him down there too. My brother, hiding in the woods nearby, could have chosen to reveal his presence, which I would suppose he would have done if his true intent was the purity of our family line, but he didn't. Instead, he watched us like a creep, then afterwards acted smug and righteous, declaring to us both that Fermin would be dead and gone by morning. He ran home to tell Daddy and my brother was right. Poor Fermin. I've never experienced such guilt as I felt those weeks following that night. Daddy and his friends put on their hoods, fashioned a cross from some old timbers, and they went hunting. It was three days before I found out for certain that they'd killed Fermin. 
They murdered him because I'm white and he's not. After the spell of darkness I endured, I wanted revenge. That's when I found out from Abby about Wicomico Church. There, I learned about the old texts and the books of the dark arts. I discovered the spiritual power of animal sacrifices and I learned Santeria. So now, my dear family of Chupacabra, you shall all suffer one by one, as Fermin and I were made to suffer. I know what it means to be born Chupacabra. I know the invigoration found in the hunt and the despair that comes without that feast. I will always suffer anyway. Should I suffer alone? I think not. From now on, this family will only be able to hunt those with wicked hearts who have chosen to display their wickedness. I will laugh in eternity as this curse slowly rots you all from the inside out. And my laughter will be twofold, because none of you shall be allowed to share of your suffering with the others. You will never be allowed to speak of this curse. Each member of this family will read these words themselves, and they will suffer alone, as Fairman did. And each member of this family will eternally remember Fairman's name. Our love may have been put to rest by the hate in my father's heart, but the hate I feel in return for his actions and what he did to Fermin shall never be put to rest. Signed, Prisa.